Okay, so this is chapter 3 for QC. This is entitled Principles of Titrimetric or Volumetric Analysis. Oh, by the way, ha, uh, you can either call this type of analysis in QC as titrimetric or volumetric. The process um, is the same. Now, when you say titrimetric methods of analysis, this is a method... Um, we do in QC laboratory, wherein our goal is to really determine the concentration of our unknown sample, or I mean unknown, we have to determine the unknown concentration of our sample using the concentration of another substance. Okay, so again, our main goal here is to determine the concentration of the sample. Okay? So that is called titrimetric methods of analysis. So for example, we have here hydrochloric acid. And for example, this is our um, unknown. I mean, uh, this is our sample. We don't know what is the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Now we can actually have it reacted with the sodium hydroxide. Now, we have to see to it that the sodium hydroxide's concentration is known. Now, um, using titration, uh, we can have the two react. So, syempre, uh, this, this is a complete um, chemical equations, you will have the sodium chloride and the water after the titration. But nevertheless, um, the concept is for you to determine the concentration of your sample, you, ha you have uh, or you need another substance in which the concentration is known. Ipapareact natin sila using a burette. So actually, yung setup niya you will be using a burette here, okay? So, for example, this one is a burette. And then in the burette, you will place the sodium hydroxide, okay? Again, this is of known concentration. So, for example, um, accordingly, the concentration of the sodium hydroxide is one normal or one molar. And then you will add this. Uh, example, this one is an Erlenmeyer flask and this contains the hydrochloric acid in which the concentration is unknown. So you just have to add the sodium hydroxide here sa hydrochloric acid um, until such time that the color of the solution here will change. And then you just have to record the volume of the sodium hydroxide uh, that is consumed in the titration process. And then uh, later I will teach you how to determine the concentration of the sample, like in here, the sodium chloride, when we have now um, the volume of the sodium uh, hydroxide na known. Okay? So this is still chemistry since we will have um, the equation for the chemical substances that uh, we reacted. Okay? Now before we move on to the computation, uh, let let us define some terminologies first that are used in <clears throat> the titrimetric analysis or the titration process. Now, for titrimetric method of analysis, the sample class is called the analyte. So if it is a mixture, then the component of the mixture that is being um, investigated is called the analyte, or the active constituent, or, or the sample itself is called the analyte. So if we go back to the example, our analyte here is hydrochloric acid, since this is the, the unknown, uh, this is our target for, uh, for the analysis. Okay, so again, we call that analyte. Now, the, the solution naman or the chemical substance that is of known concentration is called the titran. Okay? So again, um, the other chemical that we 
we we will use to react with the analyte is called the titran. And take note that the concentration of this is known. And uh, most of the time, this is the solution uh, that is added by means of a buret during the titration process. So again, if we go back to our example, if hydrochloric acid is our analyte, since this is the substance being analyzed, the sodium hydroxide that is added through a buret is called the titran. Okay, so a titran class has known concentration. We will add this to the solution of the hydrochloric acid. So again, we call that the titran. Now, it's not actually just two types of chemicals na uh, involved during the titration process. We also have the uh, another one which is called the indicator which is a chemical substance that will change its color and will signify the end point of the titration process. So I told you a while ago, if the titrant, or example, the sodium hydroxide is placed here in the burette and it is added <coughs> uh, in the solution, excuse me, in the solution here in the Erlenmeyer flask with hydrochloric acid, kailangan mo siyang lagyan ng indicator. Okay? So when you do the titration, if you add the sodium hydroxide after some time, you will know that uh, the end point, meaning you have to stop the titration process already, you have to stop adding the sodium hydroxide if the solution here changes its color. And then again, the one responsible in the changing of color is the indicator. Okay, it's the indicator for the, again, for the end point. Okay, now the end point will actually signify or um, it will represent that there is an equal amount of the sodium hydroxide and the hydrochloric acid that has already reacted. Okay, that's again called the indicator. So most of our indicators here are acid-based indicators, meaning they will change color if there is a change in the pH. So remember our example is hydrochloric acid, which is an acid so definitely it's acidic. And then if you add the sodium hydroxide, there will, there will be a neutralization reaction. And kapag ka masobrahan konti yung sodium hydroxide um, that is added in the hydrochloric acid, then there will be a change in the pH of the hydrochloric acid. And this indicator, again, will change its color if there is a change in the pH. Okay, that's how you know the end point. Now, in the titration process, we have the so-called stoichiometric point or the equivalence point. Again, we call it stoichiometric point or the equivalent point. However, this is just theoretical, meaning we cannot really see it with our naked eyes. We cannot observe it during the process. It's just a theoretical point that uh, represents that during the titration process, equal amount of the analyte and titrant have reacted already. Okay, again, uh, equivalence point or stoichiometric point yung tawag dyan. However, in the titration, what we really see or what we can really observe is the end point. Meaning, the end point means that you have to stop the titration process. You should not add any more um, titrant in the analyte because there was already a, a change in color. And that is, again, because of the presence of the indicator. So stoichiometric point, because we, we don't really have something that can measure whether equal na yung amount ng titrant and ng analyte yung nag-react. So kaya hanggang theory lang siya, theoretical point siya. But what we really see now in the titration process is when the indicator changes its color. Okay? Mag-change siya kasi nag-change yung pH. Kasi most of the time, um, we do volumetric analysis for the concentration, determination of the concentration of either acid or a base. So kapag ka ganun, um, although hindi naman siya exactly na 
equal amount of the substance have reacted already, but nonetheless, it can still represent the end of the titration process. We can assume that, um, we can assume kasi, ano, we can assume na equal na si titrant and si reactant kasi nag-change na ang kanyang pH. Yun yung importance ng endpoint. And um, during the titration process, we cannot really see the endpoint if nakalimutan natin idagdag si indicator doon sa ating analyte. Okay? So when you say volumetric solutions, these are standard solutions. And these are solutions of known concentration in the process of titration. So this is the other name actually of our titrant. I, again, titrant can be also called as volumetric solutions or standard solutions. They have known strength or they have known concentration. Now, our indicators naman are called test solutions. Okay? So again, our indicators can be called test solutions. Again, we add them in our analyte um, for us to see the endpoint of the titration process. They cause the change in color um, if there is already a change in the pH of the solution due to the reaction of the analyte and the titrant. Okay? Now... Uh, please watch the a link of, I mean, I have given a link of a video for the sample na titration process, how it is, how is it done in the laboratory so that you will have a picture on, on the process itself. So yung video na nilagay ko doon sa link is actually, ano, the analyte there is the sodium hydroxide but uh, it uses a primary standard sa ano sa titration process i'll i'll explain that next time we will have our um class na since meron pang activity ngayon so this is just an introduction now after watching balikan niyo ito um itong video kasi i'll be introducing now the computations involved in the titration process so we have uh, first, the equivalent weight, or we call this equivalent or EQ, so or, or the number of gram equivalents. And meron din tayong tinatawag na milli equivalent. By the way, they are units. Okay, these these are units that we use for the concentration of our chemical substances, and we also use them uh, for the computation of other units. Okay. So, ito naman is called milli-equivalent or the MEQ, that's number of gram, milli-equivalent, which is more frequently used compared to the equivalent weight. Now, uh, you have to be familiar with the uh, um, chemical form, uh, sorry, formula pala, formula in the computation of the equivalent weight and the equivalent weight. So for the equivalent weight class, you have here molecular weight divided by F. So later, I will also discuss how, how are you going to compute for the molecular weight. I believe you are familiar with this, uh, but we will have a review about this. And then divided by the F. I will also teach you how to identify the F later. Now, the difference between the EQ and the MEQ weight is this one. For the milliequivalent weight, <coughs> excuse me, this is molecular weight divided by F times 1,000. Okay, that's again F times 1,000. That's for the milliequivalent weight. Now, before we'll have um, an, a sample computation, uh, let me first discuss how are we going to identify the F in the computation. Now, the F is dependent on what substance are, are we investigating or are we anal analyzing. Now, for the acids, again, if we are uh, analyzing an acid, the F is equi equal to the number of replaceable hydrogen. 
Okay? So, you just have to count how many hydrogens can be replaced for the acid and that will be the F. So, for example, hydrochloric acid, as you can see, you have one hydrogen here, which means the F for hydrochloric acid is one. Okay, however, for sulfuric acid that is H2SO4, you have two hydrogen here. And this means that the F or the factor for our sulfuric acid is two. Okay, so other examples of acids that we analyze in QC lab, we have the nitric acid. And as you can see, nitric acid, one hydrogen only. So this is... Uh, no, F is equal to 1. Uh, we also have phosphoric acid. Ayan, H3PO4. So, ito naman is syempre 3. Kasi nga, uh, it has 3 replaceable hydrogen. So, yun lang yung tandaan ninyo for acid. Um, it is dependent on the number of hydrogen um, that is replaceable. Okay? Okay, now for for the bases, it's ano naman, the number of replaceable OH, the number of replaceable hydroxide. So you just have to count, like for example, sodium hydroxide, you only have here one OH, so definitely the F here is also one. And then for magnesium hydroxide, um, we have two. Okay, as represented by the subscript, you have two molecules of hydroxide here. So the F here for magnesium hydroxide is two. So all we need to do is to count. Okay, again, all we need to do is to, to count. Like um, another example, you have aluminum hydroxide. So for aluminum hydroxide, chamfer the F here is... Three. So actually, it's very important for you to have a review on how to make the chemical formula of um, our, our chemical substances, especially inorganic uh, substances, um, para alam nyo din kung ilan yung F. Kasi for example, ang ibibigay ko lang sa inyo is calcium hydroxide. Now, you know that the F for bases is dependent on the number of replaceable hydrogen or sorry, uh, hydroxide, I mean, or the OH. But if, if you have forgotten how to make the chemical formula for this, we have a problem, for, we have a problem on that. So again, uh, please review how are we going to make the chemical formula. So for calcium hydroxide, this is Ca, CaOH2, and that means that the F here is also 2 since we have two hydroxides for the calcium hydroxide. Now next, we have the salts. So for the salts, um, this will be uh, for the total positive or negative charges. Take note that it's or and it's not n, which means we don't add, we don't add the two. It's either the total positive or the total negative. But please take note that when you say a compound, um, equal talaga siya. The total number of positive and negative charges are actually equal. So you don't need to be confused here. Now, um, during your first year, I think I have taught you how to determine the charges of our substances. So if you have your periodic table there, which is I. I suggest that please do not be dependent on that because you are not permitted to use a periodic table during the board exam. So if by now, you have to be familiar with the arrangement of the elements in the periodic table. So I think I taught you that the, gr the group where they belong in the periodic table is, I will represent their charges. So for example, the first group here you can see, you can check in your periodic table, Halina, Kairobis, Sesium, and Francium. They belong to group 1A and thus their charge is positive 1. And then itong sa 2 naman, B, Mag, Kasar, Bara, and so on, positive 2. 
For the boron group, boron pababa, that's positive 3. For carbon, um, it can be positive 4 or negative 4, but we seldom use carbon um, here since it's organic. And uh, I, I think it's the reason why we have sp split inorganic and organic. Um, carbon behaves differently from all the other elements. But nevertheless, just know that the carbon can either pa be positive 4 or negative 4 depending on the compound. And then nitrogen, balik ka sa 3, pero this time this will be negative. Oxygen also, negative 2. Pababa, yan siya ha. And then fluorine, negative 1. Pababa, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so on. And um, we don't really have a charge for our noble gases. They are called noble gases because uh, they have completed the octet rule. They are stable. They don't, uh, they don't really react with other elements to form compounds. Now, the elements here at the center are the so-called transition metals. And most of them have the charge of positive 2 but with a few exception let's say we have um, elements that have two oxidation states or more and uh, let me just have a review on the uh, no, um, exceptions here the first one is the silver instead of positive one positive two positive one lang si silver si gold pwede siyang positive one pwede din siyang positive three um what else? Si copper can be positive 1 or positive 2. Si iron naman can be positive 2 or positive 3. Um, what else? Si mercury can also be positive 1 or positive 2. Um, tin also, though si tin is somewhere here, hindi talaga siya transition metal, but Tin can be positive 2 or positive 4. That is also true for lead. Can be positive 2 or positive 4. So you can see that in their names. Like when I write iron 2 sulfate. So the 2 here represents the charge of the iron. Now it's positive 2 and it's not positive 3. This is the systematic name. But if I use the common name, it will be the use of the ending O-U-S and I-C. Okay? So, pag sinabi kong ferrous, ito yung lower, oxi uh, low, lower oxidation ch charge or state. Again, ang O-U-S is the lower one, which means this is the positive 2. But if I write ferric, this will be the higher oxidation state. So, this one is the positive 3. So again, either I use iron 2 or iron 3 sulfate or whatever compound is that, or I use the common name ferrous or ferric. Just have to remember um, itong number na ito nagre-represent ito sa charge. Ang ending for the common name nagre-represent sa charge. Remember lang na the OUS na ending is for the lower oxidation state while the IC uh, represents the higher oxidation state. Okay? So, again, uh, let's have an example for the salts. You have here sodium chloride. So, si sodium chloride class, if you look at the periodic table, sodium belongs to the group 1. So, this is positive 1. And chloride is negative 1. Nasa group 7A yan siya. So, this is a total of 0. That is why you cannot see any subscript there. And then again, for the F, it's either the total positive or the total negative. So both of them are 1. So this is automatically 1. Okay? So you disregard the charge ha, in uh, identifying the F. Hindi nakasala si charge dyan. Okay? Automatic na yan siya. One. Now for magnesium oxide, mag, eh, magnesium and then oxide, magnesium is na belong sa group 2, so this is positive 2, while oxygen is negative 2. So definitely this is 2. Now how about if um, aluminum chloride, okay? This is aluminum chloride, aluminum and then chloride. So take note that alum aluminum is in group number 3, it is situated... Um, below 
boron. So this is positive 3. Well, chlorine is negative 1, but take note that it has a subscript here na 3, which means you have 3 chlorines and 3 na tagni negative 1, so that will be a total of negative 3. Multiply lang natin, 3 times negative 1. So take note total ha, that is why nag, nag inad natin lahat. So ito, ang F nito class is 3. Okay? So again, I just have to look at the total positive or negative charges for you to determine the F. Okay? Okay, so now let's have a sample computation um, for the MEQ and the EQ weight. Okay, so let us start with, uh, let me just have a blank here, blank slide for the computation. For example, uh, you are asked to compute for the equivalent weight and also the milli equivalent weight. Sorry, let me check this. MEQ weight. Example number one, you have the sodium chloride. We will we will be computing for the EQ weight or and the MEQ weight of NaCl. So remember our formula for equivalent weight. This is molecular weight divided by F. Okay. Now um, we have to compute first for the molecular weight before we can move on with the process. And then remember how are you going to compute for the molecular weight? You just have to list down all the elements present in the compound identify the, the number of atoms. So in this case, you have one sodium, one chlora, uh, chlorine. And then let's multiply each of them to their respective atomic weights. Now for us to be uniform, kindly, ano, kindly round off the atomic weights to the nearest whole number. Again, round off the atomic weights to the nearest whole number. So this is 23. This is 35. So the molecular weight for our sodium chloride is 58. 58 grams per mole. So this is our unit ha, for the ano, molecular weight, grams per mole. So we can now proceed with the computation. Equivalent weight is equal to 58 grams per mole times the F. So sodium chloride is a salt. So um, to determine the F, you have to look at the charge, either the positive or the negative. So remember, sodium is positive one, chlorine is negative one. So definitely the F here is equal to one. By the way, class, my unit tayo for the F. Um, this is equivalent per mole. Okay, this is equivalent per mole. So we can cancel the mole and we will be left with grams per equivalent. So EQ weight, 58 divided by 1 is 58. This time the unit will be grams per equivalent. So this is the answer for the equivalent weight of sodium chloride. Okay, now moving on, let's have the MEQ weight. MEQ weight is molecular weight divided by F times 1,000. Now the only difference here is we will multiply the F to 1,000 to make it milli equivalent. So the same thing, we will be using the same molecular weight because we have the same sample here, sodium chloride. So this is still 58 grams per mole. However, for the F class, uh, we will be using still 1, um, pero i-multiply natin siya sa 1,000, and then the unit will become MEQ per mole. Okay, this will be the unit of the F now for the milli equivalent weight. So just like with the equivalent weight, let's cancel the mole. 
And then, um, let's divide. This becomes 58 grams divided by 1,000 MEQ. So, 58 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.058 grams per MEQ. So, this is now the answer for the milli equivalent weight. Okay? That's how simple the computation is. Uh, please have a please again review uh, with the process of getting the molecular weight and be familiar on how to get the F. So for another example, let's have number two. An example plus sulfuric acid. We, we are going to compute for the EQ and the MEQ weight. So let's start with the equivalent weight. This is molecular weight again divided by F, but we need to compute first for the molecular weight of our sulfuric acid. Again, you just have to list down all the elements. So you have hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. And then identify how many atoms are present for each element. So we have two here for hydrogen. For sulfur, we have one. And for oxygen, we have four and then let's multiply each of them to their respective atomic weights atomic weights that are rounded off to the nearest whole number so this is one and then this is 32 kindly check with your periodic table and then this is 16 okay so 16 times 4 is 64 okay so 2 plus 32 plus 64 is 98. Take note of the unit, grams per mole. So we have now 98 grams per mole divided by the F. Now this is sulfuric acid. This is an acid. Now for the acid, um, we just have to count the number of replaceable hydrogen for us to determine the F or the factor. So for sulfuric acid, you have two hydrogen here, which means our F is two. Again, do not forget that we have the unit equivalent per mole here for our F. Cancel the mole. And then you will be left with grams per equivalent. So 98 divided by 2 is 49 grams per equivalent. So this is now the equivalent weight of our sulfuric acid. So sa isang equivalent class, you will have 49 grams. Okay? Now, for the MEQ weight, that's the same thing. Molecular weight, but this time F times 1,000. So we will use the same molecular weight, 98 grams per mole, divided by F. Again, our F is 2 times 1,000. Uh, 1, and then again, our unit becomes MEQ per mole. Okay? So you cancel mole. And then this is 98 grams over 2,000. MEQ. And then let's simplify. 98 divided by 2000 is 0 0.049. Take note of the unit grams per MEQ. Okay? So that's how we compute for the equivalent and the milli equivalent weights. So for, I know, for bases, you just have to again count the number of hydroxides or the OH for you to determine the F. Nevertheless, the process of the computation will still be the same. Okay? Now, we will have additional activity or this will be an assignment na lang for you to practice. Okay? Show your solution um, in a clean sheet of paper, any paper though, as long as it's clean and I can easily identify your answers. You have to box your final answer, ha? Huh? Okay? So we have here compute for both the equivalent weight and the milli equivalent weights of the following. So number one, you have aluminum oxide. 
I will really give you the name so that you can practice again making the chemical formula for these substances. And then um, let's have the lead to hydroxide. The number three, uh, let's have the, oh, let me think first. Phosphoric acid. The number four. Let's have the magnesium bromide. And the number five. Let's have the mercuric. Laura. Okay, so this will be passed um, before Wednesday next week. We will continue with the discussion next week also.